everybody, welcome to our very first edition of In Studio Church oh, on the Line. That's right, we are coming at you on the Line. Guys, brilliantly done there. Thank you, everybody, for just the way you did that in unison. So, uh, we are going to be gathering like this, sharing content with everybody uh, in the midst of what is a pretty crazy, unprecedented time in our world right now. And I have a couple of friends here with me uh, to discuss some of what is happening in our world, uh, what that means for us who have faith, what in general for people who are asking questions, whether you go to church, whether you don't go to church, what is all this about and how should I respond to it? I have Sia Khaleesi with me, ladies and gentlemen, round of applause. Captain of the Rugby World Champions, the South African Spring Box. Yeah, everybody. Go Bokka. And, and also, Mahlatsi Mashua is here, whose name I probably got very badly. How'd I go? 60% Sixty time. percent. It's improving. It's improving. I'm improving. <laughs> and that's a pass. Yeah. And Mahlatsi is uh, the director of Ravi, Va Ravi Zachariah's ministry across Africa, uh, which is a ministry that is all about apologizing. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> that's a kind of a Christian joke, guys. Uh, it is actually about discussing aspects of faith uh, in the world that we live in today. So it really is like a Christian apologist. That's right. Explain what that term means, because it does, people go, what does that mean? Do you just go around apologizing all the time? Or? Well, it's, uh, it's uh, helping the believer to think and the thinker to believe. Okay. That's it. Help. Wow, everybody loved that. <laughs> helping. Okay. <laughs> Helping the believer to think right. and the thinker to believe. So people may be uh, tuning in, watching, listening to us, right. who may not have a faith, but they're thinking about, That's right. you know, what, where's God in all of this? Yes. And then helping people who do have a faith to go, actually, there are some deep, you know, right. understanding of my faith. It's not just a weird surface level or hype thing. There's a reality, a depth, a, a uh, intelligence yes. to why I believe in God as well. Because you're a very intelligent man. Thank you. And I feel like just being around you makes me smarter. How about, how about you, Sia? No, I'm feeling very smart. <laughs> <laughs> I need glasses. Yeah. <laughs> I brought mine along, uh, just in case. Okay, so let's... Uh, we're going to actually ask a, a serious question. We're going to have a bit of a discussion here. And then we may throw out to some of our studio audience here. Uh, a lot of people are asking questions about what is currently going on with the coronavirus, with this pandemic that is affecting the world. Countries are isolating their borders. They're saying, you know, a South African government has said we shouldn't be gathering more than 100 people together, uh, that we should sanitize regularly, all of these kind of things. In fact, we should sanitize right now. Sanitizer. Sanit well, there well, guys, that's not a sanitizer. <laughs> but, but we do need to sanitize, so uh, let's do that as we... Guys, this is important. There we go. I'll pass that to you. We will sanitize. It is the appropriate thing to do, people. Make sure you are staying clean, sanitizing. Everyone here is sanitizing right now. It's a good thing. So because of this virus and it is the issues with it are, from what I understand, that it spreads. It's very infectious. Uh, and hopefully in one of these in-studio conversations, we're going to have uh, some medical guys as well uh, to give us some wisdom on that. But uh, it's very infectious. And if too many people get it at the one time, particularly, well, anywhere in the world, but in South Africa, we know that our medical system won't, may not be able to handle uh, the, the challenge of looking after everybody who could get it uh, at the same time. So we do need to be, we're having fun with it, but we need to sanitize. We need to be careful with our social distancing, no handshakes. It's just simply elbows, isn't it? Let me just give you an, an elbow there. Oh yeah, Bluetooth high fives. There we go. Um, so with this all in mind, uh, what is, you know, how from a faith perspective do we approach something like this? Has, has God forsaken people? Is God still there? Where, where is God in the midst of something like this? 
No, but I, I think that uh, before we even get into the specifics from a Christian or faith uh, perspective, the, there's a lot of suffering in general in the world today. There's a lot of pain. And um, it doesn't take you know, much from reading the news headlines to see that there's something wrong with the world today. And the experience of pain asks us questions about human nature and the human condition. Just as much as we ask questions as people uh, about pain, it also asks us questions. It forces us to come to terms with the human condition. And I think that it's not just a question for Christians or those who believe in God, but it's a question for everyone. Yeah. And I would say that a, a philosophical or religious system's credibility is linked to uh, the way it gives its adherence uh, categories to think about pain right. and suffering as yeah. well. Uh, of course, as a Christian, I think it's, it's, it's particularly important that we're able to make sense of it uh, because I believe that uh, from a Christian point of view, we, we have not only a way of explaining or making sense of it, but we also have practical comfort and hope. Yes, yeah, I love that. Uh, and, and I think, you know, the question for a lot of people who maybe don't have a faith or maybe uh, Christians, people who do have a faith that are dealing with others in their world who don't, the, the question is, well, if God loves us, you know, wouldn't God just remove all of this? Right. And I think what you're getting to is that actually there's a, there's a deeper point we need to get to in our understanding and our thinking. But that's a surface level question, which is yeah. very real for people. Yeah, well, on a simple, well, if God loves us, why would, why would all this happen? Yeah. So I, I know there's depth to that, to beyond that, but how do you respond to that? So if, if we start by saying, look, even if there is no God, we still have the virus, we still have pain and suffering, and we still need to make sense of it. Right. So even if you remove God, you haven't solved the problem. Yes, that's right. true. That's but true. With God, uh, I think the Christian story gives us uh, a few things that lead to comfort and hope. Like I said, firstly, is a is a big picture story. Um, it gives us a, a perspective on history and that explains uh, the presence of brokenness in this world, the presence of pain and suffering in this world. The Christian story makes provision for that. Some people think that actually the Christian story excludes that or it's blind to that. In fact, some of the verses that you will look into is Jesus actually raising this question himself. So some people think that they raise this in today's context, but Jesus actually raised this question of natural disasters and so forth. But secondly, it, it then also then uh, speaks into God's ways. Uh, what is God thinking? What is God doing? What is his heart uh, yes. right now in this moment for us? Yes. Which then leads to comfort and hope when we take a look at the cross and see how the cross applied actually gives meaning to, to what we're going through because then it moves us also from analysis to action. So a lot of people are doing quite a lot of amount of uh, analysis, uh, trying to understand the situation. Yes. And we got a lot of experts uh, speaking into this. There's a lot of information, good information. But we won't move into freedom and hope and comfort if we just stay at analysis. We need something that moves us yes. right. from analysis to action. And that's what the Christian story does as well. Yes. Yeah. So what you would say in, in summing up what you're talking about there is that for a lot of us, um, we can be thinking, we want God to simply take us out of our problems, out of the difficulties, out of everything. But I'm a parent. Okay, let me use this example. And you're a parent, you're a parent. Um, I can't take my kids out of every pain that they experience. Out of it. You know, my, my son once skateboarded down a massively steep hill with no shoes on. Um, and I don't even know if he had a T-shirt on. And it ended badly. Now, do I want to stop my son skateboarding? No. I want him to keep having fun. But do I realise that when he does that, we may end up at the medic clinic? Yeah. Which we did. Um, because he's fallen off and there's pain and all the rest of it. Uh, so to me, there's a parallel to how God sees us. He's given us opportunity to live within this world, but in exploring this world and in the challenges of this world, there's still pain. Right. But it doesn't mean God doesn't see it and God doesn't want to yes. be there with us like a loving father would when a child is in pain. Yes. In fact, so, so we talk about God having morally sufficient reasons for allowing or good reasons 
for allowing a certain measure of suffering and pain mm. now. So you mentioned one of them, uh, and I think another one is parents, for instance, can identify saying, I know that you know, my child, bringing a child into this world means that there's a possibility of them experiencing some measure of pain. Yeah. But I deem it a greater good to give them the opportunity to exist yes. in this world uh, uh, than to not exist, yeah. even though I know that there is some measure of pain. And so some, uh, uh, some of us can think about, for instance, the fact that, you know, in order for there to be a possibility of love, which is the kind of world God envisaged and planned for, there's got to be the reality of freedom. Yes. For instance, people must yeah. be able to make choices, yeah. right? Yeah. But but for people to, when people have the the, the reality of uh, 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 freedom or they can exercise their choices, it means there's a possibility of pain because they can simply exercise their choice uh, to hurt other people as well. So in order for there to be love, yes, there's gotta be thing. pain. Yeah. Uh, but 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 it does not mean I like you said. Because I have daughters as well. Yep. And I want to protect them, but I can't be with them all the time. And so I have to trust that they are going to be okay. I, I pray that they'll be okay. But as a father, I have to allow them to venture into the world yeah. Yeah. without me there all the time. And that is, I think that heart understanding is maybe helps you to understand the heart of God, giving us room to enjoy the world, but recognizing something bad could happen in the process. Yeah. But you know what, what, what God does, which is where we are limited, like I'm a dad as well and I have the same yeah. kind of limitation as you, but, but God doesn't have that limitation historically mm. um, because what he does is, is we can move, for instance, from the explanations um, to looking at the cross. Yes. And the cross is, is a really powerful moment that brings comfort and hope during this time because it tells us within the Christian I just, story. Can I, sorry, no can I just, I just want to, explain the cross yes. because I know we talk about the term the cross right. but I think there could be people watching yes. listening in so the cross means when Jesus was crucified right. which according to a whole lot of historical uh, you know facts not just what the Bible says there's a whole lot That's of right. other documentation to say that this man Jesus yes. experienced crucifixion yes. which is a horrible way to die by the Roman government yes. leadership at the time. Yes. Um, and so that's what we talk about when we talk about the cross, is this man Jesus yes. experiencing the pain of a horrible, probably yes. one of the most horrible ways to die. That's right. Uh, you know, being hung on a cross. Yes. So that cross, that is central to Christian faith, this, I, this picture of suffering. Yes. H historically, uh, a lot of scholars would agree that there was in the first century uh, what you call a, a man, Jewish man, born in a, into his community. He had a, a pretty much a quiet life for the first 30 years of his life. He had a following after that because he, his ministry, traveling, he had some form of a traveling healing ministry and people followed him, uh, believing that uh, he was uh, more than just a human being or more than just a man. And certainly that's what he claimed. But then he got into trouble with uh, religious and political leaders uh, of his time leading to uh, his death on the cross, um, he got executed. And then following his execution, very few, a short time after his execution, people started to claim that they saw him, yeah. uh, that were having experiences of him, that he had risen from the dead. Yeah. Now, this is, not, this is not just a Christian account of this. This is just what is there historically. Yeah. Now, there's a Christian interpretation of this, mm -hmm. but everybody, whether you're a Christian or not, you have to deal with this historical or these historical yeah. facts yeah. and make sense of them because the church has grown into what it is today from those few based believers. Based on this That's story. right, they're based yeah. on this story. But what the cross, the interpretation of the cross, coming back to hope and comfort mm -hmm. and, the, limit, and the, the limitations that we have as dads is that the, the, the Christian story says that God saw the mess in the world. So he created the world. The world falls into sin and decay because of humanity's rebellion. He sees the mess, but he doesn't stay outside and gives us uh, uh, directions on what to do. He doesn't self-isolate. Wow. Uh, wow. So, there you go. God never self-isolated. 
he becomes so involved, he's born into his world. He gets involved. Right? He, he gets, gets into where the virus well, is. Well, in the most intimate part yeah. of it, he gets born into the world. But then what he does is that he suffers alongside of us. So he experiences suffering like us. But not only that, but he suffers because of us, right? He tells us that he suffers because of our sin, the consequences of our sin. But then something amazing happens also. Because of his suffering, he puts an expiry date on all suffering. And this is where the whole idea that suffering has an expiry date is that all suffering has an expiry date now because it will end. There's a time when he's coming back, right, where he's going to remove it. And then, but in the meantime, when we suffer, when we have pain, in addition to give meaning, historical meaning to it, there is real comfort. His spirit comes alongside of us to ease our burden. But then he activates then the church and he says the church can do things practically to be there, to love the neighbor so that in a time of suffering and pain, we can then represent his presence now to bring that comfort and hope. This guy. Yeah. I, I mean, must go. You, <laughs> you don't need to be here. <laughs> He's like... <laughs> I, man, I love the way you explain that. I think that's so helpful for everybody, isn't it? But to me, that's so helpful for people who maybe, you know, listening, watching, who are like just on the edge with their faith or have kind of feel like they've lost faith. Just to go, actually, God, through this whole story, the idea, he didn't self-isolate. He didn't pull himself back. He got right into the epicenter of That's right. the virus, yes. you know. Yeah. In fact, took on the virus, yes. you want to use current term, yes. and then in doing that made a way for us to then have hope beyond right. whatever the virus of, yes. if we want to call it sin, this, you know, brokenness within all of us, yeah. he made a way for us to be healed. This, so I'd encourage everyone just in their own hearts, hey, to, to reach out to God and to reach out to Jesus at times like this and say, even if I feel like I have to self-isolate, yeah. God's not self-isolated from me. Yeah. yeah. And we were talking and you were saying you can relate to that yeah. in your own story. Yeah. So maybe tell us a little bit about your story growing up and how you found God in the midst of everything. Yeah. I think like when Pudmasachi was talking and it just made me think about like, of me when I was younger, you know, I was raised by my grandmother and we went through a period of time where, uh, you know, we didn't have, financially, we, we couldn't afford anything, no food, yeah. nothing. Wow. And it was, it, it wasn't nice at all. Um, so it, you grew up in what area of in, South Africa? In, in Port Elizabeth. Port Elizabeth? In, 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 in township called Zwide, yeah. Zwide. 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 Yeah. You can, okay. Yeah, yeah um, I, it was tough, but like, like what Matlati says, sometimes, no, no, but we have the Holy Spirit there yeah, to, yeah. To, to comfort us through all, through all of this. And my grandmother, you know, I think that's, that's the person that was sent for me because I was very young and she was there to encourage me. So she yeah, had a positive wow. attitude through everything and she gave me time, love and support. And that's what I needed as a young kid at the time. Mm. And without that suffering, I don't think I would be able to to be the person that I am today. Isn't that you know, interesting? I'm, like yeah. to actually say the suffering, as difficult as it was, yeah. as much as you don't want anyone you know to go through it, yeah. you don't want your kids to go of through course. it, but you know it actually did something yeah. to shape yeah. who you are today. 100%. And Wow. But you don't see it while it's happening. No. That's the thing. Not you when you're in the it. middle of it. Yeah, 100%. You look at everyone else and think, they've yeah. got a better life yeah. than me. Why can't I have that? No, 100%. And that, yeah. that's what you say with our kids as well. you got to let mm. them go through some of it, you know, mm. but we can protect them. you got to protect them. But there's something you got to let them go through because they will learn through that. If you keep yes. on stopping them, they'll never be yes. ready or be prepared yes. for when, like, Moments like this in life come. Because it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't yeah. matter how intelligent you are, how much you've studied. It doesn't yeah. matter how much money you have. Every one of us face moments of mm. suffering. I mean, on a global level right now, yeah. we are all having to deal with, you know, potential economic yeah. downturn, you know, health issues, doing life differently. Uh, so there is a level of unrest and, mm. you know, we're all kind of suffering together. And so I think the question is, do I just feel sorry for myself? Do I allow it to overwhelm me? Do I become a victim to it? Because you could have become a victim. Yeah. You could have just blamed everybody. Yeah. How did you, 
How did you move beyond that? Well, I had my grand. I had my grand, and and she went to church quite a quite a lot. So she yeah. she had she had faith, and I think she had faith for the whole house. And I think her faith was enough for everybody else in the yeah. house. Um, and and through that, uh, obviously, I started praying every day. And yeah. I didn't know what I was saying half of the time because I just <laughs> thought she told me to do the Lord's Prayer and that's what I did. And I always believe through difficult times, through times of challenge, it will give an opportunity for someone to stand up. And yeah. I think for us as a nation, this is a perfect opportunity for us to stand up and to yeah. yes. gather together from yes. different uh, groups or from different races. Yes. This has no race what we're going through right now. Yeah, that's right. The whole side, I feel like you heard mm. the president. It's time for us to be united and fight it mm. together. In saying that, I'm saying for us who are capable, who have medical aid, we have the resources, it's time for us to think about those who don't have. Mm. Like, I come from a community like that. I have to think now. That's mm. why I was blessed, so I can bless them, especially mm. in times like this. Mm. Not only when things are good. So yeah. we have to find ways where we can go and give back yeah. And try and help what we can. Yeah. You know? Like simple thing like this. Somebody can Giving out this. sanitizers. Yeah. 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 Giving out sanitizers. And they're not just giving out, like educating people. Yeah, 100%. Because That's... I think in different communities, yeah. there's different levels of understanding yeah. about this current virus. Mm. And people start being superstitious yeah. and doing weird superstitious yeah. things that actually don't in any way help. Yeah. It happened with HIV. Mm. There were all weird superstitions about how to get rid of H HIV. And I think the same thing could happen here. And so we have to educate people. Yeah. So, you know, I think in a township community, what would you say to, to people no. who may be watching, who are uh, living in communities, they're watching on their, their yeah. phone or uh, with, with a few friends? What would you say to people in these communities? I think... The most important thing is a, is a positive attitude. Yeah. First of all, that we are not defeated. We yeah. Fight this not thing. living in fear. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. You, if you start with already we defeated, then we've already been defeated before yeah. we even started fighting. I think as a country we've been proactive. We were ahead of this way yeah. before time. I remember coming in in December. I was still we were all getting checked. So, mm. and if you have it, that doesn't mean you're dead. Yeah. No. It still can be fought. That's another important thing. Yes. In the town very we important. Have, I think if you have a virus that everybody's going on, everybody runs away from you because they're scared that you're going to kill everyone. The important thing is education, obviously. We've got to yes. know why we're telling people not to cough yes. on their hands, why yeah. they must cough on their elbows. And those who know need to start sharing that, and we have to have posted around and get the information where it's needed the most yes. because we can see it. We know why we're doing it. But we need to start talking to one another and explain. And limiting, it. like... Hand, not yeah, really yeah. doing handshakes, doing yeah. the elbow, yeah. you know, finding other ways to greet yeah. people. And the space between us. But the tough part is we yeah. stay in homes where there's 20 people or 15 people in one house. In a little shack. Yeah, yeah. In yeah. A little shack. And we, you, like, there's nothing, you, there's not much you can do other than trying to keep your distance. Yeah. But making sure your hands are clean because yes. we use our hands for everything. Yes. You know, but yeah. If we have soap, wash your hands every single time. Try Regularly, to, yeah. for a longer period of time. Yeah, 100%, because we clean our mouth with our hands, and that's where that's how you, you actually can get the virus. The, yeah. the virus. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's important for people to understand that others may be suffering more than you. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's interesting at moments like this that people kind of panic, and they get very selfish. Yeah. Um, and think of themselves, which, I, I, I mean, I understand. You yeah. want to protect yourself, you want yeah. to protect your family. What you're saying, Sia, is we need to think about others. 100%. We need to actually live beyond ourselves. Yeah. And that's, you know, a massive part of the faith yeah. message, that's the right. message of Jesus. What would you say? In, fact, I'm, I'm instance, the, in the urban area, the myth is, in a time of crisis, I thrive best when I look after myself. Mm. That's superstition. That's yeah. myth. That needs to be dispelled. In as much Every as man others, for himself. That's right. Because then, then, then the Christian story comes along and says, no, that's not, that's not actually how we thrive. Mm. Uh, uh, in the same way that 
Jesus not only gives us his message, but he models it. Mm. Yes. And the way he modeled it was he hung on a cross. Mm. And, 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 and then he says, a whatever you do. very unselfish <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't run from it. He embraced it. As far as unselfish is... acts go. Yeah. You know, that's pretty high up on my <laughs> list. Uh, that should be. Yeah. Uh, and, so, and so what it does is it then it, it speaks into our faith also in the urban spaces and how we need to also align mm. with mm. the truth of the gospel mm. because you know I was uh, some of the uh, the plagues that hit the the first few centuries uh, in Rome mm. Mm. Christianity actually spread and exploded during that time right because Christians didn't come bringing uh, intellectual answers. I love those. Mm. Yes. They didn't even come with the supernatural assurance that God would protect them from the suffering. Mm. Yes. Even though I love those as well. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I love healing. I love all of these mm. uh, these things. But what they did have was water, food, and their presence. Mm. So that statistically, if you were in a plague, your chances of survival and being integrated into community were, was higher if you knew a Christian. Mm. Wow. Which, which, which in today's world, imagine if we could say, of everyone in every context, your chances of beating this thing right now are much higher if you know a Christian, but that is a challenge to us as Christians. What should we be doing? Yes. And I think we as Christians in particular should be asking ourselves, what is a, what is a faithful response? Yeah. Because during this time, I think we, as in like any, any other time, like Sia said, you know, we, we're always going to have something that's happening. And yeah. so, our response should always be uh, according to what is expected of us. Mm. Love God with everything. Love your neighbor mm. yeah. as yourself. And we've got to ask ourselves, what does it mean to love God? What does it mean to love our neighbor? Uh, to be neighborly during this time. Mm. Yeah. Because on that basis, do we hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Yes. Not any other yes. basis. On, those, on that basis, do we hear that commendation from the Lord? And so I think we, we as Christians, especially those who have, uh, those who uh, uh, you know, have a certain sense of privilege and can be able to look in the direction of others, we should be asking, how can we, for the sake of Christ, live our faith in the direction of our neighbors? Mm. Guys, thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you, everybody. Well done. Another episode of Church on the Line. The Line, sorry. <laughs>